Welcome to our second in-step session of 2022. Let me just say, for all of you who don't know me, I'm Myron Brody. I'm the Executive Vice President of the U.S. Chamber in charge of international affairs. I really want to thank all of you who joined last week's discussion. I thought a very fascinating one with Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield. The U.N. Ambassador touched on several key themes related to America's engagement on the global stage and talked about a number of uh, topics that we'll get today with our very distinguished and special guest, Admiral James Savridis. Uh, I would simply say to all of you, uh, when we talk about Russia and China, this is someone who knows how to talk about these topics and scare all of us about what the future might bring if we don't take actions and demonstrate U.S. leadership around the world. Admiral Savridis has had an incredible career, 37-year career in the U.S. Navy, rising to the rank of four-star admiral, first Navy officer to serve as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander, and as commander of the U.S. Southern Command. He earned more than 50 U.S. international medals and decorations, including from 28 other nations. He didn't ask me to say that, but simply to say that he is someone who has served our country with great distinction. Upon retiring from the military, he served as Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, and now serves as Vice Chairman of Global Affairs at the group and Chair, I should say Vice Chairman of the Carlisle Group and Chair of the Board of Trustees at the Rockefeller Foundation. In full disclosure, the President, CEO, and Chairman of Carlisle is the Chair of our U.S.-China Center, so I'm sure Admiral will have much to say about the, the state of U.S.-China relations. He's a prolific, I would say, best-selling author, having published 10 books on leadership, the oceans, maritime affairs, Latin America. And we're going to get to some of these topics during our wide-ranging conversation today. His most recent book, which I read with great pleasure, although, again, I was quite scared by the topic, was co-written with Elliot Ackerman. And it's really an engaging, sobering geopolitical cyber thriller titled 2034, A Novel of the Next World War, uh, which we will talk about and which I have here, and I want every one of you uh, to read it. Let me just say at the outset that uh, I'm delighted that not only do we have our usual in-step crowd and have a very large attendance here today, but I welcome in also our audience uh, from C-SPAN. This is being shown live today, and thank you for joining us as well. Before we get into some of the big issues of the day, let me begin, uh, Admiral, with a couple of questions about where you got your leadership. You clearly have had the chance in your career to command hundreds of thousands of people. Tell us a little bit about where you get your inspiration. What leaders brought you forward as leader, uh, gave you a sense of leadership skills that you wanted to impart on the people that you've worked with? And tell us what you think those important traits are. Admiral, welcome to the show. It's great to be on with you, Myron. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a real pleasure. And, and I've always advocated private-public partnerships. The role that business plays in helping create security around the world it is profound. So it's a real uh, pleasure to be able to speak to this kind of audience. In terms of leadership, um, I think, as is the case for many of us, I was lucky to have a wonderful mom and dad. My mom taught me the value of reading. She's an extraordinary woman, never went to college, but today in her 90s, reads two or three books a week. Love of reading, love of the ideas of the mind. My father was a combat Marine, rose through the ranks, fought in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, commanded a reinforced Marine battalion in Vietnam when I was in high school. So I, I had that kind of military upbringing, and that served me very well when I went off to the academy. Second big chapter in my leadership journey was Annapolis, where you take on responsibilities, and then you come out of the school, and you hit the fleet, and um, you, you discover what real leadership's all about. And I'll tell you three things that have stood me in pretty good stead over the years, um, none of which I think will surprise you. Uh, number one is Focus on what your peers think of you. We all spend a fair amount of time, and we should, trying to impress our boss and be loyal up the chain of command. I think most folks have figured out the idea of taking care of their people. But I think we're underweight, many of us, in thinking about our peers. 
They can save you. They are honest with you. They will tell you who you really are. Uh, number two um, is this idea of servant leadership, which so many have talked about. But let me give you a, a, a practical example of that uh, from my own life. And that would be former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates. I worked for him for a long period of time. I was a combatant commander for uh, over seven years, much of that time working for Secretary Gates. He cares so deeply. He sublimates himself. You never see Bob Gates out there trying to put a shine on anything. He's honest and true. He sails true north. That's the kind of servant leadership that I aspire to. And then number three, uh, Myron, I, I would say, learn from your failures. Learn from your failures. I've had too many to count, including failing major inspections when I was captain of a destroyer to trying to reorganize Southern Command as a four star and having that get reversed on appeal, if you will. Learn from your failures. There's three things I, I try to focus on in my leadership journey. Admiral, I, I want to get into uh, whether America is still an indispensable nation at this time. But before I get there, let me ask you one follow up here. You talked about uh, learning from your failures. How has your leadership style evolved then? Are there some things that you've seen in yourself that has changed over the years? Sure, I'll give you two. Um, I was very successful as a junior officer. And frankly, I didn't follow the advice I just gave. I wasn't really focused on my peer group sufficiently. About the time I got into command at the 16, 17 year point, I was captain of a beautiful brand new destroyer, USS Barry. As I alluded to a moment ago, we failed a major inspection. And what I learned from that experience was the value of second chances. My Commodore, my boss gave me a second chance. I learned that it is your sailors who lift you up. You gotta take your ego out of the problem. And Myron, that's where I really learned how your peers can save you. All the other captains on the waterfront called me up the day after we failed that inspection and said, Admiral, what can we, or Captain Stavridis, what can we do for you? How can we help? Your peers can save you. And it, it taught me that failure, taught me humility. And I think it came just in time. Um, and I tried to carry that with me through the rest of my career. That was kind of a pivot point. And then, as I mentioned, uh, secondly, at very senior rank as a four-star, I learned at Southern Command, my first four-star command, that you can't be the one with the idea transmitting down. You've got to build ideas from the bottom up. I failed to do that at Southern Command. I like to think I learned how to do that and took that to NATO, which is the ultimate consensus shop. And I evolved as a leader, e even at a very senior stage of my development. Admiral, you talk about humility, and I think we're at a time where the United States is reflecting on its values and its leadership position around the world at a time where we have rising competition from China. Uh, I had uh, former Secretary Madeleine Albright on this show not too long ago, and she talks a lot about it. If we have to use force, it's because we're America. We're the indispensable nation. We stand tall and we see further into the future. Are we still that indispensable nation to the rest of the world? And if we are, how is that, I think, how is that being developed in the new era where we have a rising China, a Russia that's willing to challenge us in ways which we'll get to, and many other global challenges? Well, let's start with Secretary Albright, who is someone who has been a mentor to me when I was NATO commander. She was charged by the Alliance with rewriting the NATO strategy so I got to work with her day by day for um, much of a year. Nobody finer. Um, I, I have to kind of chuckle when she says, we're America, we stand tall. Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I'm about five feet, five inches <laughs> tall. So I'm, I'm hardly standing tall. But like General Jim Jones, he really stands very tall by comparison. Um, but I think in all seriousness, there's kind of good news and there's uh, less good news here. The good news is, if you look at the hand of cards that this nation holds, I don't think any other country would hesitate to switch with us. We have vast land area. We have a young, dynamic population. We're not looking at the kind of demographic failures we're seeing in parts of Europe and most notably in China. 
We have enviable geography, two vast oceans on either side, benign neighbors, north and south. Our universities, particularly in research, are the envy of the world. We have Silicon Valley. We have the, uh, the, the high-tech belt around Boston. Um, we're still a highly innovative nation. Um, we're a democracy, albeit a fractious one. I could go on and on, but we had to pause a little more often than we do and just reflect on the extraordinary uh, privilege we have to be Americans and to be in this country. That's kind of the good news. The bad news is, and this I think is where Secretary Albright would probably agree with me, no external power in the end is going to defeat us. But within ourselves, if we can't overcome the kind of polarization we're experiencing today, the seeming inability of our political parties to work across the aisle, um, then I think we have real challenges. So when we look overseas, what I'm hoping for and what I look for is unity between the two parties. Even today on Ukraine, I think a pretty obvious case where across the political spectrum, we should be condemning Russian behavior you're starting to see a few cracks in that stance. I hope we can come together on these big foreign policy issues. I'll close on this, Myron, by saying if we can, if we can speak as a unified nation, I think America will continue to be an indispensable nation, a leader among other nations. Admiral, more and more people are talking about the polarization of our country as not only a threat and challenge to our own well-being here in the United States, but the way that we position ourselves as what the world needs is a strong, united United States when facing global challenges. And the polarization in our country is certainly a draw back from where we should be going forward. So it's an important principle to articulate. Let me ask you a little bit about the Russia-Ukrainian situation. Obviously, 2008, Putin advances into Georgia uh, and in a matter of days, if not weeks, he has already assumed a new role with Georgia and not met by the West, by the United States or, frankly, Western Europe. 2014, an incursion into Ukraine. Again, some resistance, some sanctions, but not enough to deter Putin. Now we're at the doorstep of another potential incursion into Ukraine. Troops amassed over 120,000 troops, 125,000 troops on the border. Uh, what can we do to stop Putin from trying to reassert the Soviet Union? Uh, we defeated the Soviet Union. And today, uh, Russia and Putin have to be deterred. We all agree with that. But we need a united front. Are economic sanctions going to work? Is diplomacy going to work? What do we need to do to address this situation? I think the first thing we need to do is understand why is this happening now? What what has driven this calculus. And you mentioned 2008, um, that was just before I became the Supreme Allied Commander. And then 2014, just after I left being Supreme Allied Commander. So I was sort of in sandwiched in between these two uh, invasions by Russia. And I've studied them very, very closely. And what I think is happening now are three things that are worth understanding in the context of how do we reverse engineer this thing and stop it? Number one is, let's kind of do it from the inside out. Number one is Vladimir Putin himself, um, his frustrations, his anger, his bitterness at the collapse of the Soviet Union when he was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB. Putin is about to turn 70. He's thinking legacy. He's thinking, how am I going to recreate some semblance of that old Soviet Union around the periphery of Russia? Number two, he's playing to a regional audience, <clears throat> to the nations around the periphery, but he's also playing to China, to President Xi, to Iran, to other authoritarian states. And then third and finally, Myron, he seeks to divide us here in the United States. He seeks to divide the NATO alliance. So those are kind of his three objectives that are at play here. So to your question, what can we do about it? I think the Biden administration has this one about right. And I see a lot of Republican support for the steps they're taking. Economic sanctions, kind of the zone of, of the chamber, of course, um, have to be stringent, highly enforceable, 
And so, and they have to hit Russia where it's going to hurt. I think you've got to strongly consider breaking them out of the SWIFT system. I think you strongly have to consider targeted sanctions on individuals in the government. I think you strongly have to consider sanctions against oil and gas. That economy is a one trick pony, mm-hmm. I guess, two tricks if you count oil and gas. And so um, I think the economic basket of sanctions, and by the way, I would say to Vladimir Putin, if you invade Ukraine, ain't going to be nothing whistling through Nord Stream 2 besides air for a long, long time. So I think that economic basket is strong. And then militarily, get them the get the Ukrainians, the javelins to go with the anti-armor, anti-tank, get them the stingers to take the sting out of Russian aircraft, get them the cyber capability, both defensive and offensive, give them the high-end intelligence, provide them military advice at distance. There's an awful lot we can do to make Ukraine a very indigestible porcupine that Vladimir Putin will come to regret. We need to convey all that to him. I think if we do that, we keep the allies on board. We keep unity here in the States. I think we still have a chance at seeing him take a diplomatic climb down. Well, I mean, you, you talked about the rationale and motivation of uh, President uh, Putin, and certainly his legacy somewhat in his mind depends on how he responds to this challenge with the West. Uh, it's both an expansionist view of his thoughts about what Russia is, but it's also, frankly, it's to deter U.S. and Western expansion. So let's talk about NATO in that context, because you mentioned NATO. I mean, Emmanuel Macron, who I've known for a long time, President Macron, basically said it was brain dead. Now, I know you don't take this view and this assessment, but President Trump said it was obsolete. Isn't this a challenge for NATO, not just the United States, to show Russia that uh, we can stand together tall in defending uh, Western principles, but values, but also pushing back against his aggressive tactics? Is this not the opportunity? And how do we do that if Germany, in particular, is somewhat weak need about Russia, partly because of its dependency on gas? Now, I say this knowing that Emir from Qatar is in Washington today to suggest an alternative path for Western Europe, meaning Qatar gas coming into Western Europe. But what is the state of the NATO alliance if we can't uh, refute refute the aggressive uh, tactics of Vladimir Putin? Yeah, um, just before we even dive on that, let's just, let's do your comment about natural gas. You know, we've been hearing a lot about the FSB, you know, the successor to the KGB. I got three letters for you. LNG, liquefied <clears throat> natural gas. And that can come from Qatar and it can also come from the United States of America. Right. Um, NATO, let, let's start, you know, it's a business uh, organization here, Myron. Let's start, let's do the numbers for a minute here. Um, let's talk about defense spending. The United States spends about $700 billion a year on defense. Our NATO allies collectively, the Europeans, had the second largest defense budget in the world, about $300 billion. I get a little frustrated when people say, oh, the Europeans don't spend anything on defense. That's the second largest defense budget in the world. And by the way, Russia, against whom we're lining up on the gridiron at the moment, spends somewhere between $70 billion, maybe $80 billion. So NATO outspends Russia by 10 to 1. NATO has 3 million troops under arms, um, almost all of them volunteers. That's active duty. We have 4 million reserves. We have 50,000 combat aircraft. We have 1,000 ocean-going ships. This is the richest, most capable alliance in human history. Okay, that's the good news. The challenge is it's got 30 nations now. Um, by the way, 30 nations who represent 56% of the world's GDP. Uh, but it's like 50, it's 30 different pedals on the bicycle, and people are kind of pedaling at a different rate. And you alluded to it a moment ago. And I spent four years of my life, 2009 to 2013, at that big round NATO table trying to get the Icelanders to agree with the Luxembourgers to agree with the Germans and the Brits and the French. It's a consensus organization. So it requires patience. 
and it is a challenge to move it rapidly in one direction. But again, where I started here, capability-wise, um, it's an extraordinary organization. And I'll conclude by saying, um, look at the missions that NATO undertakes. Uh, NATO was deeply involved in counter-piracy operations, for example, off the coast of Africa. That's been largely suppressed. NATO pacified the Balkans. You know, anybody remember the Balkans in the 1990s? They look a lot like Syria does today. Those were NATO operations. Um, NATO in Afghanistan didn't turn out the way we wanted it, but we went there collectively to fight terrorism. NATO involved many of the nations in the coalition against the Islamic State. And in the future, Myron, we're going to have to be involved in cyber as an alliance, in the high north, the Arctic, and continuing maritime operations in and around the continent of Europe. So I think there's still a very rich mission set. There's extreme capability. And the very fact that Putin is challenging this alliance, I think is only going to strengthen the alliance, strengthen its resolve, and strengthen its credibility. Well, Admiral, that's very reassuring. And I hope you're right. Uh, and I'm glad you raised the Arctic because I was going to ask you, should we be paying more attention to Russian activities in the Arctic? And by the way, the Chinese are also nosing around, as are others. Should we get more of a consensus with our allies about what to do about the Arctic? I would similarly say, we talked about our mutual friend, General Jim Jones. I would simply say, he's always reminding me to focus on Central Asia and Central Europe. So there are things we can do to remind Russia that we can be more muscular in the neighborhood and, frankly, more engaged with their traditional partners. What are, what are the core steps? And then I want to move on to China. Are there some suggestions here that you would make? In terms of how we focus the alliance going forward, I would put at the top of my list cyber and cybersecurity. This is an area in which no one of us is as capable as all of us working together. And um, many of our partners in the alliance and, in, and some of our partners who are not NATO members, but are exceptional in cyber, like Israel, for example, uh, Singapore, uh, Japan is very good. We ought to be thinking about this techno democracies, how we can work together to protect cyber, to use those tools coherently. That can be a very significant NATO mission. And then you mentioned the Arctic. What's happening, of course, is the ice is melting. And as a result, shipping lanes are opening, hydrocarbons are exposed. There are disputes, territorial disputes between Russia on one side and NATO nations on the other. That's the United States, Canada, <clears throat> uh, Greenland, which is Denmark uh, territory, Iceland and Norway, as well as close NATO partners like Finland and Sweden. So you've got a geopolitical thunderdome up there in the high north. That's going to require more attention and focus from the alliance as well. But at the moment, Myron, job one is deterring Vladimir Putin. Well, Admiral, uh, this is the first time I've had a conversation with someone of your level of experience and seniority where I didn't start with China. So let me, let me turn to China because uh, when you think about cyber threats, you think about technology challenges, you think about uh, saber rattling in the, in the Taiwan Straits and the South China Seas, China is a continuing challenge for the United States. And as China rises as an economic power, it remains an important market for U.S. companies. But I'm not giving spoilers away when I say that in the heart of your book, 2034, is conflict between China and the United States. There are other actors you talk about, India, which we'll hopefully get to, uh, Iran, Russia, they all play in the book too. Uh, but the conflict between China and the United States is the heart of it. The competition, the power struggle, and miscalculations on both sides. So tell me, what should be our approach towards China? And how do we avoid the military confrontation that might be, might be, if you read the book, 2034, uh, a centerpiece of your book. So tell us what might happen if we are not smarter about our policy towards China and the United States and China don't find common ground to work together on global challenges, instead are more in a confrontational uh, state uh, going forward. Are we yeah, in a Cold War is another way of asking that. Yeah, let's, let's, let me start with the book, if I may. It's set in 2034, and people have said to me, oh, 
Stavridis, you've written a, a work of predictive fiction. No, this is a work of cautionary fiction. I wrote this book specifically to show that both the United States and China can make mistakes, can make miscalculations that can lead to a loss of control, the ladder of escalation that leads to a global conflict. You know, when did that happen before? Try 1914, when the European nations, after a, a miscalculation following an assassination in a dusty corner in the Balkans of the auto of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, 1914. By 1918, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is gone. The Ottoman Empire is gone. The Russian Empire is gone. So the essence of the book is we ought to be very concerned. And this, by the way, this novel is not Tom Clancy. This is not good guys, bad guys, good guys win in the end, normally in the last 10 minutes. This is a book about two nations who stumble into a war, who sleepwalk into a war. And I am very worried about it. So our challenge, Myron, is if we agree, and I think we all do, both here and in Beijing, that we want to avoid the scenarios of 2034, how do we reverse engineer that back to the present? And here's what I would suggest. And I think this administration is working hard on this, which is we need a strategy. We need a plan for how we are going to face China, which is going to be a strategic competitor <clears throat> to us for decades. Russia is a tactical problem for us. China is a strategic challenge that is going to unspool as the century unfolds. So to sketch it out in 30 seconds, we need a plan. It needs bipartisan buy-in. It's got to have a tech component where we are competing fairly, but competing in the race for artificial intelligence. It needs a business tariff kind of component that finds our way to better balance and trade between the two nations. It needs a military component where we can deter China. We can provide the means for uh, continuing freedom of the high seas, for example, in the South China Sea. And finally, Myron, it needs a values-based component where we can say to China, we think that there are human rights violations. And China, by the way, can say that to us. And we can have that dialogue between the nations. But above all, we need a plan that has diplomatic, military, tech, business, all of those components put together in a way that can be exercised internationally, create the quad, India, Australia, United States, Japan, diplomatically, militarily, economically. If we pull those together, I think we can find our way to a, a situation with China where we can avoid the events of 2034. Well, I, I certainly hope we can find a constructive and pragmatic approach to how we address China and create that strategic framework that you're talking about. But what I will tell you is that at the same time we're trying to create that framework, we're sending very clear signals to the Chinese that we're going to focus on multilateral cooperation and alignment and our own domestic competitiveness before we really focus on how we engage strategically and comprehensively the Chinese. Is that the right approach or should we be doing it all at the same time? In I essence, think... should we expect more from China in bilateral frameworks than simply relying on working with the Europeans and the administration's approach on domestic competitiveness, which I agree with, but I think we have to have all three pieces of the pie, so to speak. I think it's actually all six pieces of the pie that I, I laid out a moment ago, but I agree you can't do one of them and expect to be successful. In other words, we can't say that we're going to put all our eggs in a military basket and build a new war fleet by uh, high-end hypersonic cruise missiles, dominate in space, um, create a militarized AI, and, and think that that alone is going to keep us out of a war with China, because it will not. You have to thread these things together, and you've got to do it coherently. You've got to do it internationally. You've got to have an interagency that works together. And to the point of our conversation here at the chamber, there's a private-public 
coordination aspect to this that's very important. One um, key thing I want to mention, by the way, and, and you highlighted him to me a moment ago, is our mutual friend, Ambassador Nick Burns, uh, heading over to Beijing. I think he's literally on his way there now. He was sworn in a day or so ago. I've known Nick for a long time. He was the U.S. ambassador to Greece, speaks <clears throat> pretty good Greek for a non-Greek American. He is someone who was our ambassador to NATO, so he really understands this kind of multinational consensus building. And he has served at the very highest levels of the State Department. I think he's the right person on the ground in Beijing. We need a plan that he can work on alongside the interagency and the president himself needs to be part of this. There's really no greater strategic challenge for the United States. Well, Admiral, I could not agree with you more on all of that. And, and, and I also echo your sentiment about Nick Burns. And I think Ambassador Burns is the right guy at this time, this challenging time in the US-China relationship. One of the defining principles, arguably, of foreign policy for the United States today is this theme of democracy versus autocratic regimes. Now, I don't think the administration would put it that bluntly. And certainly when I asked the UN Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, she tried to rephrase it. But there is this notion with the summit we did this fall or the President's summit with democracy as a central theme. Is this going to work? I mean, democracy has always been the core value and one of the key tenets of how we promote ourselves around the world. But we have a clash of political and economic systems, not just with China, not just with Russia. Think about Saudi Arabia and Egypt and other uh, countries that we do business with. How do, we, how do we confront this in a way that brings nations together rather than create the polarization we talked about that exists domestically in our own country? Well, let, let's start with democracy. You know, I'm kind of with Winston Churchill on that one, which is famous quote by him is democracy. It's the worst form of government, except for all the others. <laughs> I couldn't agree with that more. And if you if you want a, a long unpackaging of that theme, I wrote the cover story in Time Magazine several summers ago. If you Google Stavridis Time Magazine Democracy, it'll pop right up. Bottom line, I wouldn't bet against democracy. I'll tell you three big reasons. Number one, look at the long throw of human history. You know, people are, are fond of saying, oh, you know, but look at Russia, look at China. Um, you know, authoritarians are winning. Hey, wait a minute. Russia and China have been authoritarian states for thousands of years. Nothing new there. What is new over the last 150 years is the rise of democracy. If you go back to pre-1914, there were maybe 20 democracies in the world. Today, depending on how you score it, and you can get into some controversies about what's a democracy, but today there are 75 to 100 unquestionable democracies. Human history, the long throw is on the side of democracy. And the reason is because people want voice. In the end, they don't wanna to be told what to do. They don't wanna be told how to manage their lives, how to run their business, how much of this to buy, how much of that to sell. People want voice. And I think as I look at where we're going, sure, there's going to be tension and conflict between authoritarian states and democracies. But a lot of that is resulting, look at the case of Russia, resulting from authoritarian states who are afraid that a country like UK, a country of 45 million people, is going to become more of a democracy. Um, that is, to me, a signal of the vibrancy of democracies. And I, again, I wouldn't bet against them. I'll, I'll conclude by saying, as we look at different nations, we ought to realize many of them are at different stages of the democratic process. Not everyone is like Switzerland, and we're not like Switzerland. Uh, not everyone is as democratic as Sweden is, for example. Um, we're a, a big, fractious country with a lot of disagreements, but our democracy, I think, is holding together. And I look at other democracies around the world, and we ought to work with them, understanding that, as Thomas Jefferson said, you should not expect to be carried to liberty, democracy, on a feather bed. You should not expect to be carried 
on a feather bed. There are going to be a lot of bumps and twists and turns. But bottom line, I wouldn't bet against democracy because to do so, you got to bet against human nature. Never a good bet. Well, I think that's a very important point to underscore that we have to not only promote democracy, but we have to show its strength and do it in ways that others will buy into and challenge not only governments, uh, but others in civil society to be a part of that equation as we engage countries around the world that don't always share our political model. Let yeah, me, can, uh, I, can I make one other point on that? Yeah, and it has, to do, it has to do with exactly what you're talking about, strategic communications, getting out there into the world and talking about our values, modeling our values, recognizing that we're imperfect. We fail on many occasions, and so do many of our closest allies and partners. But we need to talk about our values, democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we execute them imperfectly, but they are the right values. And when I say that, Myron, sometimes people say to me, oh, Admiral, you're right. You know, it's kind of, it's a war of ideas. No, it's a marketplace of ideas. Our ideas can compete. They're the right ideas. But if we go forward with arrogance about them and try and jam them into others, we are going to be less successful than if we model the behavior, we acknowledge our faults, we talk about those values constantly, we support those who are on their journey. I think that's the approach you want to take. Well, modeling good behavior does include, obviously, uh, free markets and open markets and creating uh, avenues for trade and investment and flows of capital. Let me uh, ask you about India in this context. India is, in your book, a critical player, an emerging star on the global stage. And certainly, Prime Minister Modi is trying to show India in a different light. By the way, still a country complicated on economic terms. But what is the role of India in your mind in, in geostrategic terms? As you look at it as a potentially a counterweight to China, the complexity of its relationship with China, complexity of its relationship with Russia, it does, uh, it does have a defense relationship with Russia. How important is India to the future of democracy and frankly, uh, the future of the United States relationship in the Indo-Pacific region? It is absolutely critical. And I'll, I'll recall for you when President Bush 43 made a historic visit to India, he said, I bring greetings from the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. In their last election in India, 850 million people voted. Think about that for a minute. It is a big, fractious democracy, not unlike our own in that regard. Um, and India has many challenges. It's got a lot of bumpy road right in front of it, and it has corruption, and it has all kinds of different issues. But that road smooths out in the distance, in my view. And I would argue that when a historian 300 years from now sits down to write the history of this 21st century, she's going to pick up her pen, and chapter one is not going to be about the rise of China. I think it'll be about the rise of India because of demographics, because it's a democracy, it's linked to the West, has English as a lingua franca. It sits geographically astride the Indian Ocean, the last great unexploited expanse of sea space on this earth. There's a lot to make me want to bet on India. And I, for one, believe geopolitically it will be of increasing importance. And in the novel, 2034, we ascribe some traits to India that may or may not be where they are technologically, militarily by 2034. But as this century goes on, I think they will continue to be very important. And as in the context of China, they're crucial to this diplomatic idea of the Quad, the United States, Japan, Australia, India, that's a pretty formidable combination. India is critical for U.S. interests going forward. Well, because I want to get to a couple other topics, let me jump to Iran. Uh, Iran is also a featured uh, topic in your book. And clearly, uh, Iran today is a challenge uh, for Europe and the United States. Frankly, our alliance is tested in how we deal with Iran. 
but also in our relationship with Russia and China through the UN Security Council and through other means. And of course, there are ongoing talks. In your book, 2034, it presumes that China's relationship with Iran continues to deepen and strengthen. Uh, what kind of threat does that present and what kind of response do we have to do if Iran were to develop further its nuclear capabilities? What do we need to do now and what do we need to do to protect against the future that's represented in your book? Um, I think you're right to raise Iran because it's the next big challenge. And, you know, Henry Kissinger said to me once, um, you know, every time you solve a problem, every time you unlock the door to a problem, you merely find yourself at a new door, at a new problem, a new challenge. Every, every key unlocks a door. You think you've solved a problem and there's another one coming. I think Iran is the next one coming. Our challenge here in the United States is we tend to think of Iran as this kind of annoying mid-sized power. I assure you that's not the Iranian self-view. They see themselves as an imperial power. 2,500 years ago, they controlled the largest empire in human history on a per capita basis. Um, they see themselves as inheritors of an imperial tradition, and they're going to continue to press across a vast area of land that runs from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean and uh, from the, the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula to the very top of the Tigris and Euphrates and up into the edges of Turkey. So they're a, a big, powerful, expansive country with imperial ambitions, at least in that zone. And they correctly see they're shut out of the West for all the reasons we know. And so they are aligning very strongly with China and increasingly with Russia. And in the novel 2034, those three nations are working together. And by the way, in the novel 2034, the United States has almost no allies. Again, a cautionary tale. If we don't tend the garden of our alliances, we will lose them. Whereas China is very strategically cultivating alliances, building the one belt, one road modalities. And I think they will expand to work very closely with Iran and Russia probably as well in the coming decades. So what do we do about it? I think um, every American president and every Israeli president have committed to ensuring Iran does not have possession of a nuclear weapon. It's a dagger pointed at the throat of Israel, our closest partner and friend, a true democracy in the region. And I think we need to stand with Israel on this. Now, we are not at the point where we need a military uh, action as yet. We still have diplomatic cards to turn over. This administration working very hard on that. I see reports in the press of potential progress just over the last few weeks after the talks really stalled in the fall. So let's give, let's give the diplomacy a bit more time, Myron, before we have a conversation about what comes next. But bottom line, um, if we have to use cyber, uh, all kinds of different uh, covert and overt means, if we have to use significant military action, I think all options have to be on the table to prevent Iran from coming into possession of a nuclear weapon. Admiral, I, I wanted to ask you about the risk of over-reliance on technology in the field of foreign affairs, because it's another theme in your book. And I'll give you a chance to respond to that. But I know that uh, we have something in com common, your love of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. You have a first edition of the book, which is amazing, and it's right. Probably a whole story behind it. I think that's us. Awesome. But why is that book so special to you? What, what does it mean to you? Well, first of all, just the craft of fiction itself and, and To Kill a Mockingbird is a perfect novel. The fit and finish of the characters in it, the plot, the suspense of the story is remarkable. Secondly, it's a, it's a deceptive book. It's something that we all read when we were like 14 years old. Go back and reread that book. It is about race in America. It is about a young woman's coming of age. It's about our judicial system. It is about integrity and honesty in positions of authority. It is about taking the hard right 
not the easy, wrong course of action. Do you think maybe that's about America in 2021, 2022? Boy, I do. It's a beautiful, beautifully realized novel. And, and by the way, anytime you pick up a novel, it's a time machine and it's a simulator. And in the case of To Kill a Mockingbird, you go back to an America that seemingly has vanished, and yet you meet characters there who seem as fresh as figures you encounter today, and you get to get in the simulator and say, what would I do if I were Atticus Finch and I was asked to defend a black man falsely accused of rape in the pre-war South? He, he makes the right choice, but boy, is it a hard one. It's a gorgeous novel about everything that matters about our country today. I commend it widely. Even though I like Gregory Peck in the film, oh. don't go to the film, read the book. 100%. The, let, me, let, me, let me close, if I can, on, on your technology question, because I think it's a really yeah, important one. I have one last question about the trilogy, but go ahead. Okay, and, and I'll do, yeah, I'll do this fast. But one of the themes in 2034 is the over-reliance on technology. And in it, we see the United States very secure in its exquisite technologies. And yet we find ourselves brought very quickly to our knees because our opponents have moved ahead of us. The battle in history that really ought to illuminate this for us was 600 years ago. It's the Battle of Agincourt. This is the one where Henry V leads his tattered band of British archers to victory. Uh, this is the, the battle from which the speech in Shakespeare's Henry V comes. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. So what happens at Agincourt is the French knights, the cream of chivalry, are in the highest technology of the age, of the day. They're in armor top to bottom. They know they're invulnerable. They know they'll destroy this ragtag British uh, army of longbowmen, except when they start to cross the field at Agincourt, it's a muddy day. 8,000 of them go out on their armored horses in their suits of armor. 6,000 of them die within several hours, killed by English bowmen. That's over-reliance on technology, not being prepared for the next phase. Pretty good lesson from Agincourt. We try to bring that into 2034 as we think about future conflict as well. Well, it would be a great way to end, but I want to end with you. You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of a lot of movies. The Graduate, that scene where Dustin Hoffman is in the pool and the guy leans over and says, I got one word for you, it's plastic. So tell us in short phrase, What's the things we should be thinking about and why is the second, third book that you are preparing to write in the trilogy uh, to 234, what, what's going to be the central theme? What are we, what should we be thinking about that we haven't even talked about today? 2034 is about the danger of U.S. and China sleepwalking into a war. It's about the strategic challenges of China. 2054 is the second novel in the trilogy. It's set in the year 2054, and it deals with artificial intelligence, cyber, and civil conflict here in the United States. 2074, as you can probably guess, is about climate. Again, cautionary tales. What happens if we don't understand the full impact of artificial intelligence? If we don't overcome the civil conflicts. That's 2054. 2074 is what happens if we don't solve the challenge of climate. So the three kind of fit together as a cautionary tale for the 21st century. And I, we are deep into the second novel, should be out within the year, and then 2074 will come after that, now, all under contract. Well, Admiral, it's been a pleasure. First of all, what a distinguished career you've had for 37 years serving this country with, with great honor and distinction. And now you're serving this country by giving us some warning shots about what the future holds if we don't take the corrective actions and the U.S. needs to lead to take those actions. Not sit on the backside, but sit on the front side of history. So, Admiral, I just want to thank you on behalf of the InStep crowd and, of course, C-SPAN audience today for joining me for this session.
I look forward to interviewing you in 234 to see if the revelations in this book came through. I hope not. And again, in 2054 and 2074. But bottom line is, thank you for the contribution you're making today and into the future on these great, important uh, geostrategic debates. Thank you all for joining us for this session. That's a wrap. Thanks so much, Byron. All the best, Admiral. Thank you. Thanks, Byron. Thank you.